So now we will uh, continue by um, addressing the uh, question of intellectual property within uh, IMI. And um, I will ask uh, Magali Poineau, who is the legal manager in charge of this question in our executive office, to give uh, her presentation, which will then be open for discussion and to um, assist us in organizing the discussion. I'm grateful to uh, Philippe Kupers from the Commission and Stavros Malas, the chair of the Member State Representative Group. They kindly accepted to assist us in organizing the discussion after the presentation of Magali. I'm a bit too small. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. We will enter into more um, detailed and technical uh, discussion uh, because they are legal and sometimes it may be a bit confusing for some of you. So let's try to simplify a bit um, the wording and the process. So we, when talking about intellectual property, we have to uh, consider the fact that this IMI policy has been designed, taking into consideration the general IMI objective as a public-private partnership. And con con uh, considering this uh, IMI objective, it has been adapted to um, the different specific research needs and challenges, but also in order to achieve a broad participation of public and private entity. We are not only talking about the academic participant, the, the industry, uh, industrial company, and uh, the SME, but we are also talking about the patient organization and the regulatory agency, as it was clearly mentioned yesterday. So these guiding principles have been mentioned in the Council regulation, which set up uh, the IMI, uh, IMI joint undertaking. Clearly, the objective is to promote the knowledge creation, but also to ensure uh, a wide dissemination and exploitation of uh, the knowledge that, has been, that will be created during the implementation of the different projects while achieving a fair allocation of right and also ensuring a reward of the innovation. In addition, in the top of all these guiding principles, of course, uh, the objective was not to set up a fixed framework mentioning exactly what to do at a specific time, but also to provide to the different projects a certain flexibility in order to ensure the adaptation of these IP rules to the need of each specific project. This will be done, and this has been already done, for the ongoing project in the so-called project agreement, which is an agreement only signed between uh, the participant of each of the project. And in this project agreement, they will have to agree and to negotiate different terms and conditions within the guiding framework set up for IMI. So, as you have seen already yesterday, but also this morning, we have multiple, multiple interests within IMI, and consequently, when drafting this IMI policy, we had to take into consideration this multiple interest. So, this IP policy was set up in 2007 but was translated in legal terms in the grant agreement that has been adopted only in 2009. Uh, it was, to a certain extent, an issue for the first project because the first call was already launched when the IP policy was legally and formally adopted. Even if this IP policy was already known, it was legally translated only in 2009. So it was sometimes a bit confusing for the first project, but now we are trying to be on the right track. Based on uh, these different misunderstanding and question raised during the implementation of the first call, it has been decided to uh, ask the IPR help desk to provide a first explanatory note in order to help the different participants in the understanding of this IMI IP policy, but also was provided end of last year a clarification note, which is the result of a joint work of this IP working group, this IP 
Working Group is a group as that has been set up by our, our governing board. Uh, this IP Working Group is composed of several representatives for our two founding members, the European Commission, but also from FPA. But we have also on board representatives from the state and uh, the member state and the associated states. Some of them are here today. We are pleased to welcome them. And if you had already time to exchange with them, it might be a good opportunity to, to do it. So the objective of this IP working group was, was based on, and is still based on the uh, feedback on the first call, to exchange view on the IP policy, to also ensure dialogue between all the different stakeholders, and also to ensure the proper dissemination of the information regarding this IP policy. But we are now still working uh, on intellectual property issue, and we are trying to uh, collect different concrete feedback and experience following uh, the project of the first call. And these feedback are really important for us because it helps all of us to better understand uh, some of the misunderstandings, some of the concerns that have been raised in the past and that are still raised uh, so it's really important to make this correlation between concern and concrete feedback uh, to understand this. Just for your information, uh, main of the concern relate to the access right to the third party, to uh, the definition of affiliate, to the term of uh, and condition for the access right on the background, and also uh, concerning the definition of research use, but we will enter into detail of these different concepts in the following slides. So, some definition, because sometimes if you are already participating in your open project, you may know some of this concept, but some of this concept may be used with one definition in a program and another one in IMI program, so it is important to recall some of this basic definition. So first, we, uh, you may be faced to the background concept. What is background? Concretely speaking, background is what has been developed by one of the participants before entering into the collaboration from a legal point of view. That is the reason why we refer to the prior accession to the grant agreement, which is held by one of the participants and which will be considered necessary for the implementation of the project. After the start of the project, the participant may be faced to two other concepts, the foreground and the sideground. Basically speaking, the foreground is what has been developed by the participant following the implementation of the project. This is clearly the result of the project. And concerning the sideground, it concerns different know-how results that has been developed during the course of the project but which has been developed outside the scope of the project and which are not needed for the completion of the project. So these two concepts are really important and it's also important for you to clearly dissociate these two concepts because depending on the background, foreground and sideground, the partner will have different rights and obligations. So, after that, we have also the different purposes for which this background, foreground may be used by the different participants. We have uh, the purposes of research use. Here we are talking about the use of foreground and background necessary to use this foreground for all purposes. This is clearly the definition, other than the completing the project or for direct exploitation. If you participate in FP project, you don't have to be confused because even if we may use part of the concept, the wording itself, it goes beyond uh, the academic research. It's a bit more than this academic research. That's the reason why a lot of confusion arise during uh, the negotiation of the first call and are still under discussion. Besides these uh, purposes of researchers, we have the concept of direct exploitation. Here we are clear, it's the objective is to develop for commercialization of foreground or to commercialize the foreground itself. And at the end, the last important uh, terminology is the dissemination, more or less, to disclose the foreground by any means. It may be a publication, it may be during a conferences, it may be uh, in, a, in a journal, and, but it in any case exclude the formality for the protection when you would like to file a patent as an example. 